how you do this side. What are we doing? Number six. Morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Hope everyone is doing well today and enjoying what looks like it's going to be a beautiful day, maybe. So let's start out our singing this morning with number six, O Worship the Lord. Let's turn to page 86 now. How great thou art. <clears throat> Wander, and he 
sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. And on the cross, marvelling, gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And sing my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. Savior God to be how great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. We're glad to see all of you today. And all those that I can't see but are watching online, we're glad you're watching too. Um, beautiful day today. They said it was supposed to be really hot, but God kept it cool for us because we don't have air conditioning yet, and we, and, <laughs> and we appreciate that. I, uh, I have a few announcements. Uh, actually, I have lots of announcements, so I'll, I'll start with those right away. The first one is that no board meeting this month. Um, we are canceling the board meeting, so if you're gonna, I know it breaks your heart, but there's no real pressing business, so we'll take care of it next month and we'll be notified when. Um, I also have some disappointing news. There'll be no hike today because our hike master is lame. <laughs> he hurt his ankle and he doesn't think he'd be able to keep up with people, so that you're just gonna have to have a self hike. Hike wherever you want to, have fun, remember God while you're doing it. Um, well, let's see, got there. Oh, th I'm gonna read this. The precious Silas family of Fox Valley SDA Church has lost a son in Africa on July 2nd. He leaves behind a wife, four children, and their love and prayers are appreciated for his family in Africa and his family who are here with us. Um, if you'd like to make a donation to help them, in the bulletin, uh, there's an address and a name. Uh, send it directly to them. Do not send it to the church because things straggle along, so send it directly to this. We appreciate that. The, they're still looking for donations for the Massa breakfast and EAA, so if you'd like to uh, be able to help with that, did I miss anything, Tony? Today? That practice for choir today. If you're going to be in that, be there. And so now if we'd like to just uh, kneel, if we could, for our morning prayer.
Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for the beautiful weather. We thank you for the way you helped us through this week, any trials we had. We also thank you for the blessed hope that even when some of us leave this earth, we can meet again in heaven, and, and that's such a wonderful thing, the hope that you give us. We thank you for our life, our health, our freedom to worship. Thank you for safety. We pray for those today, Lord, that are in lands that are in war. We pray that you'll protect those that love you, that you'll help this war to end as soon as possible. Give strength and hope to the people that are suffering, Lord. We pray for those that are enslaved in some type of addiction that you might give them freedom and strength to overcome. Lord, help us to realize that we're placed on this earth for a reason and that we need to do what we can to share your message with others. So someday we can all meet together in heaven. We thank you for answering this prayer because we know that you do. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus who died for us. Amen. Our opening song will be song number 108.
Well, good morning. How are all of you today? Good. Today I'm going to show you something, and we're going to put it up on the screen so the big kids can see it too. So, Rose, if you could put it up, the, the first picture there. There you go. Okay. So you, you know what that is? You've climbed on that, Marshall. That's over at High Cliff. That's the statue of Redbird. You were up, kind of up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that is a statue up there. And um, that's Redbird. Redbird was a Winnebago, if I understand right, a Winnebago chief. Now, we, oh, we lost one of our children. He decided, doesn't like statues, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, so what do they when it, what do they usually make statues of? Usually, kind of famous people, right? Like there's statues of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. Um, there's famous military people. They have statues. Um, occasionally, you'll have some athletes have statue. But down in down in Alabama, there's a unique statue. So if you could go to the next one. Yes, you can't necessarily. I'll show you guys here. Okay, that's that's a little closer view of what that statue is. So, it's a it's a it is a bug. You're right. It's a lady. She's holding up a boll weevil. A boll weevil. And that's a that's a beetle. And you know what they do? Those boll weevils they they destroy the cotton crop. In um, in down in the south, that's what they used to grow a whole lot of cotton and. Uh, the boll weevil came up from Mexico, and it just started destroying and destroying, and it was devastating the farmers. They were losing the majority of their crops, so it was really a, a difficult situation. A lot of them were going to go bankrupt, but because of that boll weevil, they had to do something. They had to diversify, so some of them started growing peanuts and potatoes, and all of a sudden they found that they were actually making more money. So. The people, um, you can go to the next one, Rose. So the, the people put up this monument, December 11th, 1919, in profound appreciation of the bull weevil and what it has done as the herald of prosperity. This monument is erected by the citizens of Enterprise, Coffee County, Alabama. So what we want you to learn from this. This was a difficult situation, the bull weevil situation, but the people were able to diversify and they were able to actually become more profitable. In your life, there's going to be some difficult situations that are coming your way. In the adult class, we're starting about, starting about being in the crucible. So being, we're going to have, being having trials in your life. You're going to have trials. They can nearly knock you down or you can grow from them, and you can become better. You can become closer to God, but you have to have that relationship with God and stay close to him. You do that, even though it's a trial, you can, you can get better. You can come closer to God. So, all right, let's just have a little prayer, then you can uh, take up the children's offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for these precious children here and all those that weren't able to come up. We ask that you guide them and direct them throughout their lives. So no matter whatever the trials they may have, they may stay close to you and actually grow closer to you. We thank you for having them here with us today. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, it's time for our uh, tithes and offerings. The offering today is for local budget, and we always have good places to put it. And there's plenty of money. The only problem is it's in your pockets yet. So we're going to give you opportunity to fix that right now if the deacons would like to come forward. Dear Father in heaven, we're so grateful for all the blessings you give us and all the good things you do for us. And Lord, we're thankful for this opportunity to give back to you. We pray that you'll bless these funds that will go to further the work here in our local community, that we'll be able to tell more people about how much you love them. They might join us in that heavenly trip someday. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
So today we're going to be reading Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And I'll be reading the King James Version. There, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication th with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all minds through Christ Jesus. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath and Zizah. Sabbath and Zizah. God bless you. Um, so our scripture reading in Kenya Rwanda is uh, when they come to Philippi, Gitche Chakar Murongo, Murongo Agatanda Tuno Akari Ngui. Yeah, Murongo Agatanda Tuno, Murongo Agatanda Tuno Akari Ngui. Murongo Himuka Gire, Icho Mwiga Nira, Ahogo, Ibjo Mushaka, Jose, Vimengo Niman. Movie, movie, movie Savi, Mubjib, Mubjingi, Mubjingi, Yemushim, Nokwa Mahoro Yiman, Ahogo, Jose, Ayo Mumi Amenya. Azari ndire imitima yanyu yibyo mwibwira muri Kristo Yesu. Good morning everybody. Hope you're having a great Sabbath. Mike alluded to the fact that I have a little bit of a limp today. That is true. I was golfing yesterday. One of the steps I went, ouch. It didn't bother me for the rest of the day, but it sure bothered me this morning. But it's getting better, it's getting better. So maybe by three o'clock, maybe I'll be ready, so. What? Yeah, it's not swelling up. Okay, well. Anyway, it's, um, it's good to be here. I'm glad you're all here and uh, we are going to, um, hopefully study God's word and, and draw closer to him. So with that being said, if you could, if you won't just mind bowing your heads for a real a brief silent prayer. Amen. <clears throat> so the song that we had just sung as our opening hymn, Amazing Graces, Truly one of the most beloved hymns probably that was ever written. The opening words of that song, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. They tell the story of John Newton's life. And if we're honest, probably the story of many of us sitting here today. A little background on Newton. Newton was born an Englishman on July 14th, 1725, to a shipmaster father and to a mother who truly loved the Lord and who taught him the Bible and she taught him how to pray. Unfortunately, his mother died when Newton was only about seven years old. That led him to live a couple years in a boarding school until he rejoined his family after his mother remarried, or his father remarried, excuse me. Mm. But unfortunately, his mother's influence began to fade as he developed some friendships with some, I guess you'd rather say a couple of bad apples. At 11, it was decided that he would be sent to sea with his father, who had intended for Newton to work on a sugar cane, sugar cane plantation in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. But John Newton changed the plans and he signed on as a, onto a merchant ship that was sailing into the Mediterranean Sea. Before the age of 12, he had drifted from his religious background and he learned very proficiently how to swear and blaspheme God. At 18, he was pressed into naval service in the Royal Navy. <clears throat> After attempting desertion and receiving punishment for this act, he was transferred to a slave ship that was bound to West Africa. Being that he had a short temper, 
and he didn't get along with the crew and the captain. So finally, they left him with a slave dealer who made him a slave to an African princess. A few years later, he was rescued by a friend of his father and returned to England. But on that return trip, the ship nearly sank in a severe storm off of Ireland. This was a turning point in his life as he, cr as he cried out to God for mercy. But despite this life-changing experience, Newton, Newton still remained involved in the slave trade and eventually worked himself up so that he was a captain of slave ships. But in 1754, at the age of 29, Newton suffered a major stroke and he had to give up seafaring and the slave trading activities. But God was not done with Newton and he continued to work on his heart till John Newton eventually became a clergyman. Newton would become very involved with the Committee for the Abolition of Slave Trade. But he also wrote a pamphlet titled Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade. He described the horrific conditions on the slave ships and he apologized for his participation in the trade. Newton's influence started to grow and people struggling with their faith would often seek him out for advice. One of those people was a young man in Parliament named Wil William Wilberforce. Wilberforce was contemplating po leaving politics, but Newton encouraged him to stay in the Parliament and serve God where he was. Wilberforce became an ally with Newton, and he eventually was one of the driving forces that led to the passage of the Slave Trade Act in 1807. Newton's confession of faith is, it is certain that I am not what I ought to be, but blessed by God, I am not what I once was. In contrast to Newton, Newton was a man who God was finally able to turn around through trials. In contrast to him, is Governor Felix, a man we learn about in Acts 23 and 24. After Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, there was a conspiracy to kill him as he was transferred to the council. Over 40 men took an oath that they would not eat or drink until they had killed Paul. When Claudius Lysias received this information, he decided to transfer Paul from his jurisdiction to that of Felix, the governor of Caesarea. So with this order, Paul was sent to Caesarea and put on trial. Felix, the governor, was, I guess you'd call him, a very despicable man. It was said that in the practice of all kinds of lust and cruelty, he exercised the power of the king and the temper of a slave. On trial before Felix, Paul plainly showed that none of the charges against him were true. Felix, he knew after listening that Paul was an innocent man of the charges against him, but fear of offending the Jews held him back from providing full justice to an innocent man. Felix decided that he would suspend the trial, so Paul remained the prisoner. Shortly after this, Felix and his wife, Drusilla, they arranged for Paul to have a private interview with him, them, so that they might hear the things concerning the faith in Christ. Paul faithfully obliged, and in doing so, he did not flatter Felix with words of praise. He just preached the gospel. So violent and cruel had been Felix that no one had spoken to him of his character out of fear. But Paul had no fear of this man. He plainly declared his faith, and he declared the reasons for it. He held up before Felix and Drusilla the character of God, and he showed how it was man's duty to live a life of sobriety and temperance, and not one of wickedness. That there would be a day when judgment would come, and that wealth, position, 
and titles were useless to gain the favor of God. They did not matter one bit. He showed how this life is man's time of preparation for future life. Felix had never listened to the truth before. And as the Spirit of God sent conviction to his soul, he was becoming deeply agitated. Felix felt Paul's words were true, and his memory went back, went back over all the things he had done in his guilty past. He saw the cruel deeds that he had done in the past. Never before had the, had the truth been brought before his heart. Never before had he been so full of terror. The truth that he would be judged by his deeds caused him to tremble in fear. But instead of allowing, instead of allowing his conviction to lead him into repentance, he decided that he would dismiss Paul, stating that he would bring him back at a more convenient time. Felix, he had trembled, but he did not repent. For two more years, Paul remained a prisoner, and Felix would, would go to visit him several times, but the real reason for his visit was to try and gain, gain payment from Paul so that he could be set free. Greed still controlled him. Felix ended up being summoned to Rome because of the gross, because of the gross wrongs that he committed against the Jewish people. He was essentially removed from office in disgrace. A ray of light had been given to Felix, an opportunity, a grand opportunity, but his answer to the messenger was, go thy way for this time. Felix had rejected his last offer of mercy. All right, two stories, two different people, two different clear outcomes. Both men were actually quite wicked. John Newton had a terrible temper. He swore like a sailor, which he was. And he was involved in a terrible trade. Though his motives for getting involved, we may not know exactly. One can assume that as a captain of a slave ship, he was paid quite generously. So greed would certainly have been one of the driving forces into his choice of occupation. Felix was also quite a scoundrel. His treatment of the Jews was so terrible that the Roman authorities relieved him of his duties. In his actions towards Paul, by wanting a bribe, we can see that he truly was, that greed truly was a driving force that controlled his life. Both men were involved in evil activities. Both men reached out to try and, both men God reached out to try and change. With Newton, he succeeded, and with Felix, he did not. Newton chose to get on that road that leads to life. While Felix, he chose on to stay on that road that leads to destruction. When we decide to get on that road of life, there's a couple things that need to happen. First of all, we need to stay on that road. And secondly, we need to keep moving forward. It is not a parking lot. Any of you who have ever taken some children to an exciting place, be it when they were young to say Wisconsin Dells or to Great America. You know that what happens when you get closer to that destination? Don't the children get more and more excited? And that should be our response as well. As we grow closer and closer to God, we should get more excited. That's why we can't just park in that road to life. We have to keep moving. And that is exactly what the enemy does not want us to do. I mean, his first of all desire would be that, that we never get on that road. But if we do, he tries to have us, you know, take an off ramp. And if that doesn't work, he wants us to park so that we go no further. 
and he continues his work on us. This, in effect, would create a backup for other people as well. So, what are his tools? What does he use? He certainly has a whole lot of tricks. Um, little side note here, let's hopefully tie this in. I love going to High Cliff. Probably a lot, quite a few know that. You know that. And one of my favorite animals out there is the woodpecker. The woodpecker truly is an interesting animal. I mean, the rat tat tat of noise he makes drilling into trees is, it, it always attracts my attention. The secret of the woodpecker's success is simple. When he finds a suitable tree, he begins to drill. And if the wood is too hard or he doesn't find any bugs, he just hops over to another spot and he starts again. Over, over and over again, he continues until he finds some success. Our enemy is sort of similar to that. He tries one temptation after another until he finds one that is successful. And unfortunately, one of, the, one of his most effective methods for those who are not on the road to life is to cast doubt on them, to get in their head, to tell them that they're not good enough to join a church or even to become a believer. And this has worked oh so well for him. There are many who think, I'm not good enough to go to church. And if there are members that left, they do not feel good enough to come back. They end up thinking, God and the church would not want me. They would not want me the way I am. The thought grows that before God and the church could accept him, they have to change, that they have to become perfect. Oftentimes, they might make some attempts on their own to change, but really, can we make a change like that on our own? Jeremiah 13, 23, it tells us, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to evil? So the feeling grows, guilt, no hope, a feeling of being unacceptable to God and a feeling of being unable to change. Why bother? I'm lost, becomes the prevailing thought. The simple message that through Christ, God would declare them righteous and look at them like they never sinned gets lost. And that is a simple message that the enemy does not want any of them to hear. All who struggle are under a load of guilt and can rejoice that Jesus died on that cross. Their sins were among those he died to cover, no matter what the enemy says. No other gift that has ever been given, or really that could ever be given to, to man can Bring with it the peace and joy that comes with the knowledge that our sins are not counted against us. Our acceptance of God, God's gift means that we can live without fear. Well, let's look at those two individuals from the start of this message. John Newton was a short-tempered slave trader, and the actions of Governor Felix were so wicked that everyone was afraid of him. But did God give up on them? Did he say that you must be perfect before you can join my church? No. God was able to get the attention of Newton through a series of events. He repented, he accepted salvation, and he let God change him. Felix, he never did accept the message of salvation, but it wasn't because God gave up on him. The great evangelist Paul, he presented to him with great gusto the message, and he even went as far as trembling. But though his heart was moved, he refused to give in. He refused to accept the gift. God was not saying to Newton or Felix, you must get to the point of perfection first. He, he just wanted them to repent, believe, and let the Lord change them. 
A very familiar scripture to many of you, 1 John 1, 9, it states, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does that verse say some unrighteousness or does it say all unrighteousness? Putting doubt in the mind of man is clearly one of the enemy's best tools for keeping us off the road of life. But he also uses, he uses that same method for those that are on the road. His casting doubt through trials and temptations has been a very effective way for getting those who are on the road of life to either get off that road or to just simply park where they're at. Being afraid to proceed and not achieving that excitement that one receives when they draw close to God. In addition, if they get off that road, they might take others with them. Or if they just park on the road, they can certainly create roadblocks for others to get closer to God. Should believers expect that there will be bumps in the road? That some of the journey is going to be uphill? That there will be trials and temptations along the way? Well, I think we should not be surprised for several reasons. First of all, Revelation 12.12, 12, it tells us, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Satan is very active here on earth, and he is also working very painfully and powerfully through other people. Another reason is suffering trials can be a result of our foolish sins. Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. A third reason should we not be surprised about trials, suffering, and temptations is because God could, could be using them in the process of purifying us. <clears throat> Jeremiah 9.7 tells us, Behold, I will refine them and try them. And a fourth reason, God may be pruning us to make us more productive. John 15, 2 says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may be more fruitful. One of the questions that gets asked is, is it a sin to be tempted? You know, I've, I've accepted the message. I've, I've, I joined the church, but why do I still feel tempted? Well, recently I heard Pastor Steve Wolberg talking on this subject, and he made a quote that he attributed to Martin Luther. And the quote was, you can't stop birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. So we may, we may not be able to stop temptation from coming into our life, but we can, we can stop it from taking hold of our life. So how does the scripture for today, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and the sermon title, Guarding Our Hearts and Minds, fit into this all? Well, in Philippians 4, <clears throat> Paul is appealing to those who are dependent on themselves in the midst of life difficulties. The way to rise above this anxiety is to cast your cares all upon Jesus. We do this through prayer, prayer and supplication. And we do it with thanksgiving, which is a necessary accompaniment to prayer. And then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds. God's peace guides our hearts and minds like a good guard dog. In just a minute, we're going to sing our closing song, The Wonder of It All. The words of that song go, but the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is to think that God loves me. That love 
the love of God can be a tremendous hedge for us when we are faced with trials and temptations. But in order for God's love to work effectively, we need to love him back. We do this, and the peace of God, which passes all understandings, will indeed guard our hearts and our minds. If you love God, and you desire to have his peace and understanding guarding your hearts and minds, I'll ask you to please stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, number 75. Heavenly Father, it truly is a wonder of wonders that you love me, a wretch like me, who you have offered tru a truly amazing grace. Lord, grant each and every one of us here the courage and the wisdom to accept your love and your mercy as we go about our lives. And if we need to be polished and pruned, Lord, be at our side so that we may feel your presence through these difficult times. Be with us the rest of this Sabbath and throughout this coming week. We pray today, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen.